Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today I will be discussing red eyes in ophthalmology and this is very relevant and specifically aimed at medical students and undergraduate exams. I remember being a medical student and when studying subspecialities never knowing how much detail that one needs to go into. So this video is aimed at providing you with the pertinent relevant points specifically for a group of common conditions that cause red eyes in ophthalmology and this will hopefully help you to prepare for both your written undergraduate exams i.e. your SBAs or your MCQs as well as providing good guidance with respect to OSCEs and or ISCI examinations. So if you are a medical student and are studying your ophthalmology block at present please to kindly continue watching. The first condition I'm going to cover is that of angle closure glaucoma. This condition will typically present with a painful red eye and the patient may have a headache and temporal pain, brow ache as well as nausea and vomiting and they may describe halos when they look at lights so the halos are around the lights. Their vision may also be reduced due to corneal edema. On examination you will find classically a vertically oval mid dilated pupil, corneal edema, a narrow or closed angle and a red eye. The other important feature that will be present is elevated intraocular pressure. This condition needs to be diagnosed and managed promptly because otherwise it will result in irreversible damage to the optic nerve head and this is potentially catastrophic for patients. What needs to be done is the pressure needs to be acutely lowered. This is usually done with a drug such as acetazolamide which is taken either IV or orally and then other drops are instilled into the eye to try and lower the pressure further. The other red eye condition that I will now like to go on to describe is iritis. Iritis is a condition in which patients present with a painful red eye. The pupil in this condition may be slightly myosed. The pupil border and size may be irregular and that is because of a component of this condition called posterior synechiae where the colored part of the eye the iris sticks to the lens you get irregularity in the pupil border and shape there's classically a ciliary flush so that's redness in a specific pattern around the eye and the intraocular pressure may be lowered or it may be slightly high um, so that's something to bear in mind Importantly with this condition patients also have photophobia so that's a market sensitivity to lights and this will definitely be quite obvious when you're trying to examine them under the slit lamp or with a direct ophthalmoscope if you're in casualty and you do not have a slit lamp. It's important to take a thorough history for these patients because they may very well have something in their underlying medical history that potentially puts them at risk of getting iritis. Iritis can be associated with HLA-P27 conditions such as ankylosing spondylitis. You can also get it with inflammatory bowel disease, Ritis syndrome, etc. So definitely read up about the systemic associations um, associated with iritis. You can also watch my video about iritis to learn more about iritis which I will link below and also I've provided a screenshot above on screen now. In terms of subspecialities one thing I used to always struggle with was knowing as I said how much detail to go into and that was um, very relevant when it came to treatment options. So the key thing I would say is know the broad um, management strategy that is used to manage these conditions. So for example for iritis the broad management strategy is the use of steroid drops. You will not be expected to know the individual names of drops but if you know that it is managed with steroids which are initially used very frequently and then tapered down that will be enough at your stage at undergraduate level. Also patients benefit from 
um, the use of cyclopentanate or something similar which will dilate the pupil and reduce ciliary spasm which is contributing to the photophobia. Patients will obviously have blurred vision if their pupils are dilated so it's important to warn them about things such as driving. Usually iritis has no underlying systemic association in about 50% of patients but if there is enough of a clinical suspicion that something underlying could be triggering the iritis then it is important that these patients are thoroughly investigated. This is why a thorough history is always stressed at medical school as it can provide you with invaluable clues as to the drivers of disease. The next quite obvious um, cause of red eye is a foreign body and a stem or a question will outline um, typically an industrial or an occupational form of injury such as a mechanic was going about their day-to-day -day business and they suddenly noticed a painful red watery eye and upon presentation to casualty eye casualty or main ED they are found to have a foreign body which is potentially embedded into their cornea. This needs to be dislodged which will require copious amounts of anesthesia and good cooperation so a good explanation to the patient regarding what you are about to do is very important. After the procedure then patients are given something like chloramphenicol which prevents a secondary infection and also it helps to lubricate the eye which will aid in the healing process and relieve discomfort for the patient. It's important in these patients to also dilate and look at the back of the eyes because a foreign body, particularly if it has impacted into the cornea at high speed, it can penetrate through the various layers of the eyes and cause significant damage, including, for example, iris trauma, bleeds, traumatic cataracts and retinal detachments. So it's very important and it's considered somewhat negligent if one does not as examine the eye in its entirety when someone presents with a foreign body. The next condition I will be discussing is conjunctivitis. As a medical student, remember, there's a bacterial conjunctivitis which presents with a mucopurulent discharge. There's then viral and allergic conjunctivitis which can present with a clear discharge. In terms of the allergic conjunctivitis at med school level, it's usually expected that you will be aware that it is a bilateral condition and in a case history, the patient may very well have underlying allergies. A viral conjunctivitis is quite markedly red typically, it's highly infectious and the patient may very well have been run down leading up to the eye infection or they may have come into contact with somebody who's had the condition. A bacterial conjunctivitis has this mucopurulent discharge and again this can be potentially transferred from an infected individual. So hygiene practices, not sharing towels, not touching one's fellow eye if one eye is already affected are very important bits of advice to pass on to patients. Bacterial conjunctivitis will tend to resolve um, itself i.e. it's self-limiting but chloramphenicol is typically given and a viral conjunctivitis despite being a viral infection um, is sometimes covered with chloramphenicol to prevent a secondary bacterial infection. Allergic conjunctivitis is usually given topical um, anti-allergy drops and or a combination of oral um, anti-allergy tablets to help relieve the discomfort. Viral conjunctivitis and allergic conjunctivitis can sometimes benefit from the use of a cold compress. In terms of exam questions, one thing to look out for is a non-resolving conjunctivitis, which is being treated as a bacterial conjunctivitis, should raise your suspicions that this could potentially be an underlying chlamydial conjunctivitis and swabs need to be taken urgently. If you watch my conjunctivitis video, which I will link below, and I have shared a screenshot of it above, you can learn more about conjunctivitis in a lot more detail. The next two conditions that I'm going to discuss, but I'm going to discuss them together, are episcleritis and scleritis. Episcleritis, as the name suggests, is slightly more superficial, and then these scleral vessels are beneath this. 
episcleritis tends to present with a painful red eye. Um, in terms of pain, patients usually just describe a mild discomfort. Sometimes they can actually be unaware of any discomfort but be aware of the presence of a red eye. It usually has no underlying systemic causes and these patients may be treated with either no treatment, mild lubrication, mild steroids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and it tends to clear up quite nicely where scleritis is a condition that is much more serious and it can have several underlying systemic associations including things such as rheumatoid arthritis the blood vessels tend to be a lot more angry looking they're a lot more engorged and they can sometimes take on a purple hue type appearance to differentiate clinically between episcleritis and scleritis, a history will help, um, symptoms will help. So scleritis patients find that they tend to be um, woken up at night in pain. That's how significant and severe the pain is. In terms of the scleritis, if it has progressed to involve the back of the eye, so posterior scleritis has also now become an issue for the patient. Their visual acuity may be reduced. And clinically, if one uses 2.5% phenylephrine, then the episcleritis blood vessels will blanch whereas the scleritis blood vessels will not blanch. So this is a nice clinical test. If one does feel that this is scleritis, then several investigations will need to be performed, including a vasculitic screen. And this should be performed under the guidance of rheumatology and or ophthalmology. It goes without saying, these conditions are inflammatory. So therefore scleritis is treated with anti-inflammatory medications. If there is an obvious underlying cause and trigger, such as rheumatoid arthritis, then once the systemic condition is treated and managed, the eye symptoms tend to resolve. But in the short term, the eye may need to be treated with topical medications. The next favorite condition in terms of medical school undergraduate exams is that of a subconjunctival hemorrhage. This condition presents with a markedly bright red eye. It may be painful, usually not. It's usually either asymptomatic or mildly uncomfortable. The patient may be on blood thinners such as um, aspirin or clopidogrel. They may be taking um, anticoagulants such as warfarin. They may have sustained trauma to the eyes. They may have high blood pressure, which is poorly controlled. They may have also been um, exerting themselves from the point of view of the Valsalva maneuver so patients may have been straining on the toilet due to constipation. This condition is thankfully um, confined to the conjunctiva and it, its appearance is far more scarier than the actual clinical state. This condition tends to recover um, itself over approximately a two week period but in the interim patients may be given lubricants to help with any discomfort. It's important to take an accurate history because in the presence of um, pain, in the presence of double vision and a subconjunctival hemorrhage for which one cannot see the posterior border, one should be very suspicious of a potential orbital fracture. If patients are found to have a subconjunctival hemorrhage and they're not on any medications and they have not sustained any trauma and there was no straining or valsalva maneuvers involved, then it's important to refer them to their GPs to have a full cardiovascular screen, including a blood pressure check. The next favorite exam question that I'm going to discuss is that of a herpes simplex keratitis, which provides a beautiful picture of a dendritic ulcer on clinical examination upon instilling fluorescein. So the first thing to do is be able to spot this as a spot diagnosis and then know some of the key features which are the patient may have a history of cold sores, the patient may be currently stressed due to exams etc. The patient may have had this in the past and also on clinical examination there will be a reduced sensitivity to corneal touch. Management wise it's important to consider the depth to which the viral infection is penetrated but it's important to know that antiviral medication will need to be given in terms of tablets 
and in terms of a topical therapy. In the context of clinical exam questions, if the stem mentions that this appearance of a dendritic type ulcer is present in a contact lenses wearer, then the diagnosis of acanthamoeba keratitis should be considered and treated for until proven otherwise and in this condition the dendritic appearance is usually that of pseudodendrites as opposed to actual dendritic ulcer configuration. The final condition I'm going to mention which is again a classic textbook exam question is a patient who presents um, typically one to three days after a cataract operation with a painful red eye which is discharging and they complain of very very poor sight. The diagnosis is that of endophthalmitis. The condition can be caused by a variety of microorganisms and therefore it's important to cover for most of these things. On clinical examination there will be anterior chamber activity so cells and flare, the eye will be grossly red, there will be the presence of this spot diagnosis which you can see on screen now which is a hypopion and that's a collection of pus essentially in the anterior chamber. The level of knowledge as a medical student that you should have is that this condition um, in terms of its treatment requires different routes of administration of medication so as well as topical medication this will require the injection of antibiotics directly into the vitreous as well as taking a vitreous biopsy. These patients will be admitted to hospital and will be kept under very careful observation. There are also several other causes of dry eyes. I have just discussed today the very common exam question type causes of red eyes but other things that can cause red eyes include dry eyes, blepharitis and entropy on picture so it's important to have these in the back of your minds and read up about them but in terms of what I presented today definitely have these at the forefront of your minds both for exams, OSCEs slash ISCEs and then during your practice in the early years of your training as foundation doctors. Thank you so much for watching this video about red eyes. I hope you have found it useful. Please do click the like button and subscribe. If you would like me to make any more videos pertaining to certain ophthalmological topics then please do let me know and I will endeavour to do my best. Take care. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>